Here we come. Uh, I don't know what's uh, happening there. I'm sorry about well, that. Well, I, I hope the FCC isn't listening yet. Um, uh, Probably the NSA. <laughs> what, uh, why did you choose the name Justice for the Justice Party as the name of your party? Well, because it connotes fairness and equity. We talk about economic justice, social justice, and environmental justice. And I, I think that the word justice captures perfectly well what it is that we're pursuing as the Justice Party and what I'm talking about throughout this entire campaign. There is no justice in a nation where we have the greatest economic disparity in terms of both wealth and income than at any time since the 1920s. Uh, think about it. Uh, the, the, the massive increase in wealth during the past decade, more than decade, when there's yeah. been s- yeah. such great economic growth and yet stagnant wages for working men and women and their families. Um, we build up a very healthy, thriving middle class after World War II. Uh, there was a, 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 a there was fairness in taxation. The wealthy were finally paying their fair share. It may have even gotten to the point where they were paying more than their fair share, uh, at least in the in the highest income tax brackets. But now, it's it's just amazing to me that for the first time in our nation's history, we could have been fighting two wars and charging it to our children. And at the same time, giving, not just failing to pay as we went along and raising the revenues, but actually giving massive tax cuts to the wealthy. These tax cuts, if they continue, are going to cost our nation trillions of dollars. And... We're not looking out for those who come after us. We're not really interested in reducing our debt when we turn a blind eye to the revenue side of our budget. Sure, there are cuts that can be made, but it takes both. You know, if you run up your family credit card, you don't just say, well, we'll start spending less. You're going to have to go out and bring in more revenues to get it paid off and pay off the interest. But we're wasting so much money in interest payments on this outrageous accumulated debt in the neighborhood of $16 trillion right now. We pay every year as much in interest on that debt as we spend on 12 departments of the United States government. And that just screams out lost opportunities. And it also screams out that we really are mortgaging much of the future of later generations. And at the same time, with the baby boom generation now moving into retirement, fewer of us in the workforce and not altering Social Security, we ought to be means testing it so that the wealthy who don't need it aren't going to be drawing off of it. At least it ought to be staged in over time, a means testing. But we also have a cap on the payroll in taxes for Social Security. So those who make over $110,000 a year are paying much less of their income as a percentage of income than what the rest of us are paying. Let me There's have- no in that. There's no just Absolutely. So that's just one example, of course, and we could go on all day long to point out the injustices. But at the core of this, at the very root of it, is our system of government that has become so corrupted by money that nobody questions anymore on the right, the left, the middle, nobody wonders anymore why it is that Congress and the White House do or fail to do what they do because of the impact of money. Let me ask you, uh, but by the way, I agree with you 100% that $110,100 cap 
on Social Security saves Mitt Romney 12.2% in taxes every year. And, uh, I, you know, there, there are... Uh, the reports are saying that in 2036 we're going to have a shortfall in uh, Social Security and that we'll only be meeting the, uh, the, uh, the obligations of 75%. Well, that could easily be rectified by uncapping or raising the Social Security limit. Uh, I, I find it unconscionable that uh, people like... 11 percent when you and I or uh, if we have our own business we're paying 15.3 percent in employment taxes right there plus we're paying federal income taxes and we don't get that capital gains tax break now 15 percent which is ridiculous also uh, uh, Congress uh, voted down a, a house bill and in fact Chris Murphy who's running as a Democrat bill that would have taxed carried interests, not at capital gains rates. In other words, hedge fund managers and investment CEOs are being taxed at 15% instead of that most Americans are being taxed at. That is egregious. I, by the way, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you. I was born in 48, and I remember the highest marginal tax rate being 91%. Uh, JFK became president, Lyndon Johnson. That rate came down to about, I, I think it was 77%. And we had a great boom. He also introduced the investment tax credit. And when the uh, capital gains tax rate uh, came into effect, uh, I'm recalling this from uh, memory as a child, but I think it was the capital gains tax break was uh, half of the capital gains was not taxable and the other half was taxable. 15%. Uh, I saw a major change in tax policy and in the Democratic Party beginning around 1980. I was at Purdue University and I was in a strategic management class, and I was the only one who saw major corporations as not a, a large conglomerates as something to be concerned about. Everyone was for it, and here were all your future MBA people. Uh, they were buying into this big phenomenon, but uh, ignoring the Sherman uh, Antitrust Act. And I never hear that mentioned except for people like <laughs> I, it, I mean, it, I, I it think was pretty... in 1980, uh, when Ronald Reagan came in and uh, he lowered the marginal uh, tax rate there in the for Reform Tax Act, uh, at one point, and then George Bush came in and, and raised it up. But uh, I, I just saw that a, a major, major change occurring in America, and since 1980, as you mentioned, the, uh, uh, the greatest transfer of wealth occurred. The elite class increased their wealth by over 400 years. Uh, have, uh, their wealth has declined. So, I, you know, I, a lot of this occurred because of the change in the tax policy. I, you know, empirically, yeah. if you look at the evidence. And and a lot of it is because of the Democrats back then. But did you hear about Pelosi's, Nancy Pelosi's latest proposal? Democratic leadership has become in Congress that she's proposing now that instead of eliminating the budget-busting Bush tax cuts for those who make over $250,000, she's suggesting that the tax cuts be eliminated only for those who make over a million dollars a year. Well, I, I think that it, was 
Obama even suggested that before her too, right? Uh, wasn't that Obama's proposal? No, he was a two. He he'd been talking about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. apparently lacks entirely the capacity to go out and make his case to the American people so that they'll push Congress to do the right thing. And so now what do we see from the Democrats? Moving off the $250,000 mark and allowing the Bush tax cuts to remain for everyone up unconscionable. That's telling our young people that we really don't care about shouldering you with this enormous debt and the interest burden that they're going to be shouldering. It's saying we don't really, we're not really serious about cutting our deficits, about getting a handle on on our nation's debt. Uh, and it's telling working class people that we're no, there's not a party anymore that's really looking out for you. Now, those, those Bush tax cuts were to have expired. That was the promise made to the American people. Now, the, the Republicans forced President Obama, and it's not a force that I think he couldn't have dealt with if he'd had it in him to do it. He promised during his campaign. He caves on those just like he caved on the public option for health care. And now they're actually talking about caving on not letting them expire, except for those who make more than a million dollars a year. Uh, he should be, the, people in this country, the middle class, should dismiss him completely out of hand and say, you know, you're you're just trying to out Republican the Republicans. We're not going to put up with it anymore. They ought to tell the Democrats generally values, and we all need to come together and change the system. Why? And that's why we formed the Justice Party. And it's it's time that you know. We watch people throughout the Arab world stand up against their dictators. It's time that we, the American people, shrugged off our complacency, stood up, took a stand, and said, we're not going to fall for this lesser of two evils nonsense anymore, this nonsense about spoiling the election. We're all going to assert ourselves we're going to draw the line, say we're not going to put up with it anymore. Be heard, support a different party, support different candidates, and never again fall for this duopoly of the Republican Democratic parties who profit so much from the corruption in our government. Well, it, and by the way, it. I noticed a change in the Democratic Party uh, when Bill Clinton was in office. Uh, you know, Alan Greenspan was hailed as the uh, the greatest Federal Reserve chairman since the birth of the nation. And uh, he surrounded himself with Wall Streeters. And uh, a lot of changes occurred on Wall Street under Bill Clinton's watch. And... Uh, um, well, you got rid of the Glass-Steagall Act, for yes, instance. And Alan Greenspan. Yeah, well, Alan Greenspan, actually, even with Glass-Steagall in place, had allowed a merger of an insurance company, uh, an investment bank, and a commercial bank. He found a way to do that, and then Bill Clinton basically said, and Congress said, well, we might as well open it up for everybody. Unbelievable that they would let things get set up for this kind of economic disaster that we faced. And now with more and more deregulation, you know, Bill, my problem isn't so much with the greed on Wall Street because we expect people to be greedy on Wall Street. And except for, well, except for the massive fraud that took place and every one of them that, that engaged in that ought to be held accountable, but they never will because Wall Street 
contributed so much to President Obama's campaign, and he surrounded himself with so many of these people who would expect that they would ever prosecute anybody for their illegal conduct. Again, it's this two-tiered system of justice that we have. But the, w- when Congress and the regulators have, have deregulated to the point that these folks were able to engage in this reckless speculation and putting these fraudulent products on the market, uh, these derivatives, putting these toxic mortgages together, and then selling them off as if they're triple A rated securities. And you know who bought them? I mean, it wasn't just other banks. It was pension funds, working men and women's retirement funds that were buying these products and now have suffered such a tremendous loss. On average around the country, one third of the value being lost. So any, all anybody needs to do is look at their 401k plan or their pension plans and see the losses from 2008 forward. And you can hold accountable. We need to hold accountable those who helped pave the way. And then President Obama, who comes along after the fact and surrounds himself with the same people who helped pave the way toward deregulation, you just got to shake your head and say, why do we ever put up with this? What? Isn't there a point at which we're going to say we're drawing the line and we'll never vote for Republican or a Democrat when they have led us to this point of disaster? What, what, and then we haven't even started talking about the imperial presidency and the, 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 des, the, the, the destruction I don't usually stutter, but I get so upset about this. (laughs) Being a lawyer, somebody who values our constitutional values, somebody who always looked at our nation as being at least aspiring to be so great and and providing liberties and civil rights and human rights in, in a way that so few countries have ever aspired to do. And then to see... The ratcheting up of the imperial presidency, Congress standing by, allowing this to happen, and President Bush and now President Obama gathering to themselves so much power that was never contemplated under the Constitution, even to the point of asserting the right to indefinitely detain up to somebody's lifetime, even U.S. citizens without charges, without trial, without legal representation, without the right of habeas corpus. It is absolutely subversive. It is anti-American. And we shouldn't, as a people, ever allow that to happen. But what happens? You get a Democrat to do it, somebody like President Obama, a president who we saw from the New York Times article today, is approving, personally approving, the the unmanned drone strikes that have killed so many innocent bystanders in countries where Congress has never authorized these acts of war, completely in derogation of the Constitution's War Power Clause. We stand by and watch this happen in our country. Congress allows this incursion on the powers that belong to it, including the sole prerogative to declare war. And then when somebody challenges these abuses to our Constitution and the courts, the very perpetrator of these offenses, the executive branch goes into the courts and says, oh, you can't, you can't move forward with this case because to do so would mean the disclosure of important state secrets And so the courts say, okay, case dismissed. So now we have no checks and balances in our system. Bill, that is the very definition of tyranny. And we, the American people, owe it to ourselves, to our nation, to those along who come along in the future to stand up and, and not allow this to happen any further. Because... Up until 12 years ago, although we've had our failings as a nation, we've always aspired to those values. 
that we've seen, our generation seems to be okay about just letting go. I, I, Where are the lawyers? Yeah, by the way, um, there was not one Democrat challenging Obama in a primary, especially with this tyranny occurring. Uh, you know, I, I hope I'm not guilty of uh, committing Godwin's law here, but you look in history, history repeats itself. And I, I used, you know, I saw Mein Kampf. My parents brought me to that movie when I was a child, and we watched it. And I wondered how a whole race could, uh, German people could allow this to happen. And now I see what's happening in our country, and it's almost like uh, there's a complacency brought about via the media. Joseph Goebbels, uh, radio was very influential uh, in Germany. Joseph Goebbels was famous for saying, if you, uh, well, Adolf Hitler was, uh, if you repeat a, a lie often enough, it becomes credible. And Joseph Goebbels took that statement one step further and said, the bigger the lie, the more credible it becomes. And I look at our country now with the media, and uh, I, I guess I see a parallel here that the American people have become so complacent about our aggression overseas without an act of war. And even our Congress, I do not see, well, except for Bernie Sanders and maybe Ron Paul, but I, I don't see people coming up and really challenging, you know, uh, this sort of aggression against other countries. And we've been doing it now for 20 years at least, if not longer. Yeah, and it's often hard to make Nazi analogies without having them dismissed out of hand. But I think the point is a really important one. Yeah, Eugene Ionesco in his play Rhinoceros, it was an allegory about the rise of fascism in Europe. And people were just making all sorts of excuses why they shouldn't get involved, why they shouldn't stand up and speak out against what they saw happen. And we see the same thing in this country. People saying, oh, it's none of my business, or, oh, it's so complicated, and these people must really know what they're doing. Well, they don't. <laughs> you know, they don't. They, they may know some things that aren't disclosed to us because it's become such a secretive government. But the fact remains, we have people playing with joysticks with unmanned drones in Somalia, in, in um, uh, Pakistan, even still flying over Iraq, even though we say we've taken our troops out, we still have unmanned drones there. In Yemen, I, yeah, and, and when we attack people there, we're taking them out left and right. There are also innocent people being killed. And then we wonder, why are we less secure? Why are these people so angry with us? We've, we've made Pakistan absolutely furious toward the United States. We've created such insecurity for the Pakistani government and created so much anger among the Pakistani people. Remember, they're a nuclear power. Can you imagine Al-Qaeda or the Pakistani Taliban taking power in Pakistan, because through our atrocities, we've made the people so furious with the United States and with any government that we might be helping out there. Um, we, we're as bad as our conduct has been toward others in other countries. Even if we're simply to consider our own security our own well-being and the well-being of those who come after us in our country, what we're doing is so self-destructive. And we, the American people, can't remain complacent anymore. We've got to stand up against this. And certainly we've got to stand up when we see the president claiming the power to indefinitely detain even U.S. citizens. I mean, is this gulag America now? where our government can actually 
agents of the government can just come to your home, round you up in the middle of the night, disappear you, put you in a military prison, your family not even know where you are, not provide any legal representation, not allow an independent forum for you to go to, to, to have somebody independently determine the lawfulness of your detention, and no trial and no charges. This is unprecedented, Bill, in this country. And again, it's not to say we haven't had our problems in the past, but we've always aspired to much greater. You know, the, 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 after the abuses by the intelligence community during the Cold War, Congress, both houses of Congress had investigative committees, and the Senate was a church committee. Even President Ford appointed the Rockefeller Commission to look into these abuses, and they were disclosed. We found out about the abuses by the FBI, by the CIA. There was legislation passed to try to make certain that these abuses didn't happen in the future. Now, the message by just about everybody in Congress and certainly by our president and his administration is let's just sweep it all under the rug. No accountability. We're just going to look forward, not backwards. No accountability for illegal surveillance of our communications. No accountability for war crimes. And we're going to, if somebody challenges them in the courts, we're going to make certain that the courts no longer provide a check on those abuses of executive power. Again, it's absolutely subversive to our Constitution. It's subversive to the values that our country and its people have held since the very founding. It's subversive to the rule of law. And without the rule of law, without one system of justice where nobody is above the law, we are living under a tyranny, and it's getting worse. I'm not an alarmist. I'm not exaggerating the situation. This is where things stand right now. And I would urge every American who values these long-held values, the rule of law, our Constitution, due process, equal protection of the law, the principle that everybody is accountable under the law, and checks and balances among three co-equal branches of government. All of us who believe in those values have got to take a stand and say no more. And the best time to do that is during an election where we send a message that we, the American people, aren't going to put up with it anymore. Now, Rocky, um, you, you mentioned the women's suffrage movement, the civil rights, and uh, there was a third one. Oh, Egypt. Three instances where you can bring about change. Uh, there was also the Vietnam War movement. I was I, I was very That's right. active in that as well. I I uh, worked on Eugene McCarthy's campaign in 1968. That was before your time. But uh, no, I, no, I, 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 I remember Eugene McCarthy well. <laughs> I collected the most signatures to get him on the ballot here in Connecticut. So I I had the honor of meeting him in New York. But the uh, what. What can the American people do now? I know the occupiers, I applaud them for what they're doing. What, do what, too. what can the average American do now? I mean, uh, I, I know we have to get you on the ballot in 50 states. I know here in Connecticut, we have to get 7,500 signatures by August 6th to get you on the ballot. So let's talk about what we need to do, what we can do uh, uh, as, as members of the Justice Party and as concerned citizens. What specifically would you uh, suggest to the American people? Well, Bill, there's not any one magic bullet. It, it, I think involvement in the electoral system is absolutely crucial. I totally disagree with those who say, well, it's broken and it's so corrupt. But in addition to that, we all need to work outside the electoral system as well. We need to take to the streets. We need to support the Occupy movement. And that's not just a matter of taking some food over to those who are occupying. It's getting involved, showing that by numbers, the American people have absolutely had it. 
And, you know, the Occupy movement is supposed to be about the 99%. It's not just supposed to be about a few thousand people that are out there occupying. But it's about all of us who have common interests and common concerns. And I I wouldn't keep out the 1% either. There are plenty of people in the 1% that believe in these shared American values. But, uh, yeah, you go back, the anti-slavery movement, the women's suffrage movement, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the, the, the labor movement, they all were successful. They started in the streets. They were all successful because people at the grassroots kept up the fight. They, 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 they had it in them to, to carry on a sustained battle for what was right. And we need to be able to do that in this country. It's not a one-time deal. It's not showing up at a demonstration and going back to sleep for six months. So doing everything we can, showing up uh, when, whenever there is any kind of, of public forum, a demonstration, a rally, uh, an Occupy event, showing up when our elected officials show up, you know, it's becoming more and more the trend, as in Salt Lake City, with our supposed, calls himself a Democrat. I think that's a joke. But our congressman, who uh, is, is, they call themselves blue dog Democrats. I call them yellow belly Democrats. <laughs> but he doesn't show up at public meetings anymore. He holds town halls over the telephone, highly scripted. They vet the questions that are going to be asked. This is a congressional representative, and he's been doing this now for years. Absolutely shameful. Yet, why we, the people, when these folks are working for us, ever cast a vote for them again is beyond me. It shows the timidity of the American people in large part as well. So I just say we've got to do everything we can. Uh, express our points of view, let our elected officials know there will be a political price paid if they don't do what we demand of them. Well, Well, if our elected representatives are voting to continue the Bush tax cuts for those who are making over $250,000 a year, we need to tell them they will never, ever have our vote again. um, Well, we don't have choices given the fact that we have a Republican and a Democratic Party where they're essentially the same on many of the foreign and economic policies. One's a little bit more liberal on social policies. I I, I think that's why, you know, 50% of the electorate doesn't vote. And and also people are are so discouraged that they, as you said, They feel that the system is broken beyond repair. Uh, If we do have a dictator, I think the electoral college also contributes to that. Yeah, if we do have a state like Utah. Yeah, and by the way, I I think we do have a totalitarian corporate state. I, you know, a dictatorship, as you said. How can we, how can we work within the system, though? Uh, All right, so support candidates such as yourself. Uh, take to the streets. Uh, anything else? Uh, I mean, I'm. Uh, you've inspired me when I heard you last December. You know, on Jank So, uh, uh, you offered hope, and uh, you were talking about this about if Egypt can do it, so can we. And I, I agree. Yeah, I mean, look at social media. The opportunities we have to spread the word. I mean. You know, we'll put out things, and when I see a, a few dozen people share the messages, and all you have to do is make a couple of clicks, type in a few words, maybe. You know, we've got to rise to the occasion. We've Just in the back of our minds, we have got to keep that little voice going, do more, take every opportunity you have, uh, write letters to the editor, Show up. Officials know that they're never going to have your support again when they act against the public interest. This is supposed to be government of, by, and for the people. And instead, it's government of, by, and for 
the very wealthiest of corporate interests who have been buying their way in Washington, D.C. for far too long. And it's having real impacts, not only on we, the American people, but on people all over the world. Well, I... I, uh... Is there anything else you would... Oh, by the way, you were... Um Green Party, um, I mean the Justice Party. Are you, are you different on certain issues, Rocky? Um, you know, I I think the Green Party has had a tough history. They've been around for over ten years. Uh, no major electoral successes. Um, I respect what they're doing. I respect their positions. Uh, I got to know Jill Stein a little bit. I think she's a really great woman and a, a, a very good candidate for the Green Party. Uh, I admire what they're doing. I don't want to. I'd like to see us all come together, but I, I really feel strongly that we can't see ourselves as just simply liberals or conservatives anymore in this country. We have so many things that ought to be unifying us. And we need a broad-based approach. We, and, and, you know, maybe I'm naive about this, but it seems to me on the most fundamental kinds of issues, we can bring all sorts of people together who say, okay, we've got these differences. We're not going to be so doctrinaire about it. We can hash out those differences down the road. But when it comes to getting rid of, of corrupting influence of money, restoring our democracy, restoring the rule of law, uh, ending these wars, uh, ending this pattern of wars of aggression. You know, you talked about Nazi Germany before. Wars of aggression, which are wars where you attack a country that doesn't pose any imminent danger to you. It's the very definition of our war against Iraq. It was clearly an illegal war of aggression, completely illegal under the UN Charter and under the Kellogg-Briand Pact, but it, it was wars of aggression that were prosecuted and for which people were convicted at Nuremberg. And Justice Robert Jackson of the United States Supreme Court, who was the chief prosecutor there, said that if the, this international prohibition against wars of aggression is to have any meaning, it's not just to be applied against aggressor Germany, as here at Nuremberg. It's to be applied as against every nation, including those sitting in judgment here at Nuremberg. And yet, you roll things forward this many years later. Do we even hear the American people talking about the, the Iraq war being an illegal war of aggression? About there being any accountability? About stopping all of this nonsense. The, 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 the arms manufacturers uh, exploiting this situation around the world. Uh, our military, and by the way, you referred to the de defense budget earlier. Uh, I've, I, it's hard to get over because we've heard that all our lives. It's not a defense budget. It's, a, it's an aggressive military budget. It's an imperialistic military budget. That's what we're spending all this money on. There's very little of it that's being spent on actual defense. So we got a lot of work to do, but it's going to take the American people waking up, committing to take action, and persevering. And we've got to show that we still have, have the stuff that, that led our founders and the, the rebels during the Revolutionary War to fight price for our liberties, for, for these American values that it seems like are just being shredded now and with so little opposition by the American people. Uh, do you think uh, Dick Cheney and George Bush uh, should have been uh, charged with war crimes? 
Absolutely, they were guilty of war crimes. The, the law, the, and this is this is said without vindictiveness toward any particular person. If it was a Democrat, Republican, I don't care. It, if you're, if you've ordered or have allowed the commission of war crimes, and torture is a war crime, and waterboarding is clearly torture, we've we've court-martialed our own troops for waterboarding, for torturing. 1900 in the Philippines and again during the Vietnam War, we court-martialed our own servicemen. So yes, if the law's been violated, those who violate it need to be held accountable. What Barack Obama announced right after he became president about, oh, let's just forget about it and forward, not backwards. Absolutely shameful for any American president to disregard the rule of law the way he did. And we need to get back to that. But again, I'm not saying that we now have to try people for these war crimes, but I do think it's really important to have independent investigative commissions, bodies that will gather the facts, finally disclose them to the American people, which is what any citizen in a democracy is entitled to, and then commit to take those measures to make certain that they don't happen in the future. But instead of doing that, Bill, we've just allowed the situation to get worse. George Bush, you know, people talk about Barack Obama being the lesser of two evils. Actually, he's the more effective of two evils because I don't think George Bush would have gotten away with targeting U.S. citizens for assassination. I don't think he'd get away with with being the, the judge, jury, and executioner when it comes to drone strikes that are killing so many innocent people. I don't think that George Bush would have gotten away with signing into law the power for the president to have even U.S. citizens indefinitely detained without any due process. But when because he would have seen enormous opposition from the Democratic Party and others. People would have been out there in the streets. It would have been a huge political battle. But when it's Barack Obama doing it, the Republicans get behind it because apparently a lot of them don't really care. They're okay with these kinds of violations of human and civil rights, at least the very right wing of the party, which seems to have control of things these days. But then the Democrats blindly get in line. And as I said during one of my demonstrations during the Bush administration, when he came here to Salt Lake City, we brought out thousands of people. Blind faith in bad leadership is not patriotism. And in fact, when you just blindly follow a leader in this country that is taking our country down an entirely different path, a far more authoritarian path in disregard of our long-held values, then that, in fact, is being, as President Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt said, you're just being servile and, in fact, unpatriotic not to challenge the President of the United States. And with that, I'm going to have to run. I appreciate the interview and the opportunity to further get out the word, Bill. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rocky. And uh, please... Please stay in touch with us and let us know what we can do on your behalf. All right. Thanks so much. You take care. You too. Thank you.